So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 71st monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, we are recording this meeting, so if you do not wish to be recorded, you should now leave. Um, my name is Anthony Upward, and I'm one of the co-founders of the group. Uh, and uh, we are going to have a presentation today from Kelty, Katie Elder on some of the research that she was doing at the University of Cambridge uh, about 18 months ago, she finished it, uh, and we're very thrilled that uh, she's able to do that today. Um, the agenda for today's meeting is in the chat, or uh, the is in the link in the chat, and I will just resend that again just to make sure everybody's got it. And, uh, see that quickly. So if you look in the chat now, you will find the URL uh, to the uh, web page that has the agenda for today's meeting, and also on that page you'll find a list of who's here. Uh, and their affiliations based on the information provided. So uh, just as a, a, a few words of introduction from uh, myself, uh, first of all, something we always do uh, based on our uh, Canadian habit now of uh, acknowledging our privilege, but generalizing this given that we're a global organization, uh, we want to acknowledge that this is sacred land on which we are each privileged to be, uh, that uh, this land, the nearby lakes and sea, depending on where you are, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. And we're privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honour and respect people's indigenous to your place, whether that's yourself or others who are uh, in your place. And today we wanted to also recognise that if, uh, uh, we're now increasingly a home to people from across the world and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. Also just want to recognise where we are. We're actually not in this building today, we're in another one, but this is where we would normally be. Uh, this is the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design. Uh, and so we'd just like you to invite you to reflect on where you are biophysically as well as socially. Uh, so do you know which watershed you are in today? Uh, anybody want to shout out to the, do you know which watershed you're in today? Anybody know? So here in Toronto, we're in a watershed called Russell Creek, or was known by settlers as Russell Creek, uh, that we, they buried in the mid 1870s. And I've been looking for some time for the indigenous names uh, for Russell Creek, but been unable to find it. So I invite you to think about where you are in your place. And of course, uh, delivery of sessions like this is very important on place, just as in fact life in general. And if you want a specific example of this, if you visit the bathroom in your place, imagine where uh, that is going to end up. Uh, and for those of you who know the Flourishing Business Canvas, of course, uh, this is why we have biophysical stocks and ecosystem services on the canvas so we can think about organizational dimensions of place. Um, this group, for those of you who uh, uh, are new to the group, uh, we're a global community of innovation practice looking at how can we innovate to design scientifically feasible and desirable future enterprises that are fit for the future. And uh, we are a knowledge mobilization initiative. Aha, two, two late arrivals due to the change in location. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, we are a knowledge mobilization initiative. We're hosted by the Ontario College of Art and Design University's Strategic Innovation Lab. Uh, and uh, we have a number of collaborations working on a number of different pro projects with a particular focus on small and medium enterprises as our preferred change vector. And one of the reasons we're excited by Katie's presentation today is because of her focus on small and medium enterprises. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, these are the uh, six projects that our members are working on that where they're choosing to claim an affiliation uh, between their work and, and this group. Uh, and I wanted to highlight that there are three other projects uh, that are kind of in the stage of forming. So if you are interested in any of those, uh, one's on product design, one's on, um, software, which in fact uh, Andrew Simpson is one of the leaders of that, and there's a third project which is escaping me right now, which is kind of in the forming stages. Uh, so again, if you want to talk about forming a project or joining one of the existing projects, uh, you can see the wiki page uh, for the existing projects and uh, for forming new ones, uh, reach out and uh, we can have a conversation. Uh, so uh, another thing that we do is we connect between this community and other communities and uh, Reporting 3.0, in fact, is now uh, affiliated uh, with us as a formal project, particularly their work on new business models. Uh, but we also have a blog, sustainablebusinessmodel.org. We're also connected to the B Corp Academic Roundtable. Uh, we're also connected to the international conferences on new business models, which is happening. The third one of those is happening in Sevilla in June. And there's been a very nice overview of what we, what's going on in the field done by our member, Florian Ludeka-Freud and Christoph Denbeck. And Florian is, in fact, presenting next month 
on uh, some research that he and the graduate students will be doing around patterns uh, of uh, sustainable business models, in fact, extending the work that Nancy Boffin has been doing, which uh, Katie knows all about. Um, so, uh, I, just a final advertisement. We are looking for somebody to help us with the organization of these monthly meetings. If it's something that's interesting, uh, then please reach out to me, uh, Skype chat, uh, LinkedIn message, uh, or text message would be the appropriate ways of uh, doing that. Uh, and again, it, this could be interesting to people in terms of uh, getting to know our, us as a community, uh, etc. So without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to Katie. So uh, Katie's going to be talking about her research on Canadian manufacturing SMEs. Uh, and so let me get out of this presentation and go into Katie's here and then turn the computer towards Katie. It's that. Here we go. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm very excited to get to put my research out into the world um, because I did not go down the path of publishing it. So I'm excited that I still get to share it um, in this way. So um, my research uh, was at um, the University of Cape Bridge Robinson College in CISL, um, and Dr. Nancy Bakken um, was my supervisor, and she's the one who actually introduced me to this group. Um, so I have two goals really for my presentation today. One is to provide real world examples to help inspire um, other businesses ideally or for pract practitioners and researchers who will be working with other businesses and also to share how I completed my research and how I found the SMEs um, because this was one of the most challenging aspects um, of getting the research started in the first place. So some kind of practical examples of how I did that. Um, for other students who may want to go down the same path. Um, so I'll go through some of the research background, the data collection, the frameworks that I used, and then I'll get into the really exciting part, which is the cases. So there was eight companies um, that I looked at, and I will um, use examples from seven of the eight today, and then talk about some of the key conclusions um, from the research. Before I jump in, I wanted to say a huge thank you. My research wouldn't have been possible if Nancy hadn't connected me to this group, and then through connections from this group, I was able to kind of get my research rolling um, as well. It was this group plus some cold emails um, that really got everything going. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone. Um, Alexander Joyce, I was introduced to through this group, and he actually played a huge role in helping me edit. Um, and I've not even met him in person, and he invested a significant amount of time in doing that. So I'm very grateful to him. Um, and then the other folks um, who helped with finding the companies, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so a little bit of background. So why did I pick um, this topic of business model innovation for, um, and this industry? Um, so I originally, I, I come from a product marketing background. And so as I embarked on my master's um, studies, I um, imagined I would look at product um, innovation for sustainability and how products could be made more sustainable. Um, and then once I started working with um, Nancy, she was the one who really um, opened my eyes to the idea of business model innovation and how that could be a lot more um, impactful and radical than just having innovation at the product level. So then I started going down um, that path of looking at what could business model um, innovation look like how could it be more disruptive versus more incremental product innovation? Then I looked at, you know, from an environmental standpoint, the impact of manufacturing um, versus a service um, type firm. Uh, and then I wanted to do something um, based here in Canada. And so from an industry standpoint, looking at SMEs, so 99% of the manufacturing companies in Canada are considered SMEs. Um, and they account for um, about almost 30% of Canada's GDP. Um, and while it's hard, a bit hard to find um, data, there are some sources that um, indicate that 80% of all the environmental impact that comes from businesses is coming from SMEs, and about 60% of all commercial waste. So it's a very significant um, impact that these small organizations have, which I know that um, most of the folks who are part of this group um, would know. Um, and then, of course, SME research is considered the final frontier. So there was very few, as I started um, really digging into the research, there was very few kind of documented especially cases um, around SMEs. And so I thought that would be a very uh, good place to focus. 
Um, this is just a background that I included on some of what the key terms are. I use the Canadian definition of SMEs, so small being less than 99 and medium being less than um, 499. Um, and then really, I'm sure most folks as part of this group would be well aware, but really defined a business model as how an organization creates, um, delivers, and captures value. And then an innovation being a change um, to the way that they're doing that, uh, but a sustainable business model innovation um, being some type of reduction in impact or improvement and positive impact on the environment and society while ensuring a healthy financial structure to enable ongoing operations. Um, and then I will reference the sustainable business model archetypes, um, which was work that uh, Nancy Bakken um, had published previously, which is one of the frameworks I use as well. So my research question was around um, examples of Canadian manufacturing SMEs pursuing business model innovation for sustainability. What types um, using the sustainable business model archetypes? Uh, and I found that having a framework to use to frame um, some of the work was actually very helpful as part of the interviews um, with the companies um, because it made it a bit more tangible um, and I think practical for them to understand uh, more because those outside of, um, uh, I don't think business model innovation is that broadly understood. So it was a very practical framework to help guide the questions. Um, then what are the types of behaviors? Uh, are they more radical or more incremental or more radical? And then how did they get where they are? So what type of behavior was it? Was it proactive or was it reactive? Um, and you'll see that there's a bit, there is a range across both of those um, vectors in the research. As I mentioned, one of my goals was also to share with you how I managed to get this data. So as I went down the path of finding these SMEs, I um, leveraged what I call experts, um, industry associations, and then networks where um, SMEs were participants. I used interviews with experts or connectors, as I called them, to then get linked in with the companies. And ultimately, I had eight companies um, that I interviewed. So a little bit about um, how I got them. So I had four companies in Quebec and four in Ontario. So both started with cold emails. So on the Quebec sampling, I reached out through the Business Network for Sustainability to the SME branch based at the University of Montreal um, and was in touch with um, Jean-Francois Parenteau, um, who's no longer there, but was extremely helpful in connecting me with um, Pierre Filion, who was at the time the president of EPAC, which is a Quebec Plastics Industry Association. Um, and then he invited me to attend a innovation session where I was able to do some site sampling. Um, he was hosting a workshop for um, Quebec-based um, SMEs on how they could incorporate innovation processes um, as part of their um, work to grow their businesses, make connections with other businesses. And so he knew that there was going to be several companies on site um, that I could ask. Because one of the challenges of getting, it's not just getting in touch with SMEs, but they tend to be you know, people who are highly involved in the business, who would want to talk to, they tend to be very busy. So this was an efficient way to um, kind of corral them during the breaks in this conference that they were already attending. So I was able to get four um, companies through that process. And then in Ontario, I also sent a cold email um, unsolicited email um, to Cindy from Calstone, um, which is one of the companies I'll talk more about. She then put me in, she offered to be part of the research and she also put me in touch with Eric Milliton from Partners in Project Green. Um, and then he put me in touch with uh, and personally introduced me to the three other companies. So I just wanted to share a little bit about the process. I know it can be kind of daunting, but I did find that even cold emails were a good way to start and then it led to these connections with um, industry associations and networks who were then able to make the personal introductions to the companies. Okay, so, yeah. Um, so uh, how easy would it have been for you to expand if you'd had the time, the scope, mm. how easy would it have been to snowball again? <laughs> Oh, I think, I think I absolutely could have. So if I'd had more time on the day when I was at, uh, on site in Quebec, I could have gathered more um, from that, uh, from being on site. And then I could have also asked those people 
to refer me to other people because okay. I think having that personal connection was was very important um, and being there physically. So if I if I had um, been able to go back to um, Quebec, I think I could have set up more um, connections that way. And then um, for the Ontario ones, um, Eric was happy to put me in touch with a lot of their member network through personal introductions. So I absolutely think I could have gotten um, a broader range had I had more um, time to, time. to okay. go to go broader. Um, but yeah, he was very helpful in in making those connections. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the goal of the research was, you know, shed some light on great examples, and I wanted to share this as an example because I think it's important as uh, once obviously you're deep in the research process it becomes very um, second nature to think of business model innovation as being a common um, concept. Um, this was one of my favorite quotes that came out of the research from Sheila Story, who's the CEO of Sawmill Sid Inc. She said to me, I was worried when we started the interview, I don't have a lot of sustainability elements to share with you. Our entire model is green and sustainable though. So this was, and this was about two years ago, and what's very exciting is um, now as we've spoken, I think having gone through the process and I shared the research um, back with her, now they really do embrace this whole concept of the fact that their entire business model um, is sustainable. But this was um, a great quote from as I started um, my initial interview with her about her thoughts on um, an interview about sustainability. Um, so the sustainable business model archetypes are the framework that I used um, to assess the types of business model innovation um, in the companies that I looked at. And there's really three themes. So there's the environmental and technical, social, and then the organizational and um, economic. Um, so across these nine, I will go through an example from each one um, using uh, the cases. And then I overlaid these archetypes, um, which I mentioned before, I found were very um, helpful and in a practical way for the interviews to give a bit of a framework on what types of um, innovations I was looking for. Um, and then I overlaid that with combining two other, um, two other models that had already been created. So one from Kluwitz and Hansen, um, who had done a very thorough, um, uh, re a systemic review of SME literature uh, and come up with the um, come up with a, one framework and then there's also the Schultegger, um work as well which I combined to create this so um, part of the Kluwitz and Hansen work really focused on what are the barriers and drivers um, for SMEs to embrace uh, an, an innovation for sustainability. Um, and they categorize them as being internal and external. Um, they also talk about um, whether they're incremental or radical. And then the Schultugger framework talks about are innovations more reactive or proactive. So that's essentially why you get to the um, two axes in the the kind of simple template um, that I created for the purposes of the research. Okay, now to get to the interesting part. So the eight companies, um, as I mentioned before, so four were from Quebec and four were from Ontario. They range in size um, and they also range in age. So as I mentioned, these were really, um, I didn't have, aside from meeting the SME criteria, I didn't have a set criteria in terms of revenue or number of employees. It was just really looking for um, interesting cases um, to include, but sharing this is obviously the, the size of the organization and also how long they've been around for has a major impact in terms of um, how they innovate their resources, those types of things. Okay, so the first, um, Example, company example and archetype example. So, yeah. so, so, sorry, it just no struck problem. me. Yeah. So you were able to share the names of the companies, which is not always the case in research. So was that difficult to get them to agree that you could talk about this publicly? No, I just asked them. Right, and they said yes. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah everyone was very willing to share, and that's actually one of the um, points that we'll get to later in one of the archetypes is the playing a stewardship role. Um, and a lot of a lot of the companies, not all, but a lot, several of the companies 
who are proactively involved in sharing with you know industry sharing cases and so you'll see some interesting examples of, of some of them in particular so you also talked about the correlation of size and the age of the company is there any correlation to whether they're more sustainable or less depending on the size and the age and also you haven't displayed revenue here but is there an opportunity that revenue would also increase that maybe companies that were more profitable would be more sustainable or companies that had less employees were able to be more sustainable because you end up in a midpoint between them that doesn't really work out. Yeah, I didn't do that type of quantitative analysis. Um, I didn't, but it would be, it absolutely would be possible for you to gather that type of data um, and run that type of analysis. I didn't get that. I mean, they're all private companies and so getting them to share revenue information um, some would give ranges, not everyone was giving um, specific figures, and there's some publicly available information about growth figures, uh, but there's no kind of direct, like I didn't, I wasn't looking to drive kind of a causation between those types of factors. So, but you did mention about older and employee size. So did yeah. you notice anything there? Were older companies more sustainable or less? Um, we'll get into it in the, some of the key themes. So I think one of the elements that's really interesting about some of the older companies, for example, you've got some of the companies from Quebec, um, all the companies from Quebec from the, like the 70s, 60s and 70s. These companies have, I would say, innovation as part of their culture and that's how they've been able to be successful and survive for so long. So now they happen to be embracing business model innovation or elements of business model innovation for sustainability but they've been successful because they have a history of innovation um, be it in uh, developing new products or in their acquisition strategies that they've had um, and then i think so sawmill sid is one of the examples that you'll see comes out as being one of the most like proactive and radical um, examples and that and they are you know one of the well, youngest um, and smaller. So you could also, but again, I wasn't looking to drive any kind of specific outcome of age or size. It's really more of just pointing out like the practical examples. So the first um, case is a company called Del Viro. Um, and then I also, the person who I interviewed um, was a manufacturing representative for them um, from a company called Enerlights. So they're Canada's leading LED light manufacturer. They have an 80,000 square foot um, facility in Etobicoke, um, and they actually do the manufacturing um, in Canada as all of the um, case companies do. At the time I interviewed them, they had about 103 employees. I expect that that's grown significantly um, since that time. Um, and they were ranked in the Canadian Profit 500 um, for being one of the fastest growing companies in Canada. They were ranked 33rd um, at the time. Um, a few years ago, um, and I expect that they're, you know, continuing to grow um, successfully from then. Um, the benefits, so uh, there's multiple benefits from um, installing or retrofitting with LED lights, um, aside from just the energy cost savings. So one of the um, interesting examples that we'll that I'll get into is that. Um, there's actually also a labor savings in the in the fact that you don't have to be replacing them so frequently because um, they last so much longer. So where they where they fit from the framework. So the way that just to briefly give the background on how I use the framework. So I would ask um, a bunch of background questions to the companies and then also go through the nine sustainable business model archetypes with them, asking if they felt that there was examples in their company how they applied, and then after I map them against the um, type of behavior and the degree of business model innovation. Um, so Del Viro was a, one of the great examples of maximizing materials um, and energy efficiency. Um, these are photos, um, again, you know, there's a lot of companies that wouldn't want photos of their manufacturing facilities being shared, but these are, um, these are available actually on the company's website um, and publicly. So this is their manufacturing site um, out in Etobicoke. So as I mentioned, in addition to the energy savings benefits that you get by retrofitting with um, LED lights, the fact that they can be installed, um, particularly in industrial environments in very like high or hard to reach places, actually has significant labor and safety um, advantages. Um, and then their entire operations, so their own proprietary manufacturing processes um, that they use, 
um, help to maximize the materials that they're using because they have lower defect rates, lower quality issues. They have their own um, teams on site um, to do their quality assessments. Um, and then they also um, recycle obviously on site. And then they're also looking, they also experiment with different solar applications. Um, so when I visited their facility, they were, um, they were experimenting with having a solar panel run the lighting for their parking lot. Um, so they're looking at ways that they can reduce their own um, energy consumption through their operations. Any questions on the first one? These guys produce primarily in Canada. Are the competitors usually overseas? So you outlined that they were manufacturing in Canada, which is obviously all the companies in the case are of that. Is there, uh, are there competitors coming from overseas? Is that primarily where it's coming from? Um, they have competitors both in Canada. So there are other um, Canadian uh, LED light manufacturers in the industrial space um, that I know of in, um, in Ontario. Um, and then they do have overseas um, competitors as well. That was one of the interesting insights that they shared as part of the research was that the LED industry, the LED light industry in general, um, for people who were early adopters, they might have had a bad experience if they got a product from um, the, an imported product because it may not last as long. And so that was where they saw the opportunity with doing the manufacturing in Canada was to ensure that the higher quality levels would give them. Um, like a better quality product with a longer life. So <coughs> some of their products um, actually can last, if you have them on 24 hours a day, can last up to 28 years. But they come with a 10 year warranty. So when you use the word maximize mm -hmm. um, efficiency, uh, that suggests that on some scale, it's as good as it kind of gets, but it doesn't really address the question of sustainability or, so I just wondered if, if you were using any of, what kind of framework are you using to make that statement? About the, ma the, the maximizing maximize. material and energy maximize efficiency? efficiency yeah. mm -hmm. So I think that, so these, all of the nine um, sustainable business model archetypes, namings, they're sometimes referred to in different ways. Um, so this one is really around um, how do they, within the, the confines of like each individual case, how would they look at like how would they look at maximizing that and minimizing waste? So um, this was an example where I felt not only did they not only does their product inherently um, provide a improvement versus what companies are currently using, um, but then within their own operations, they are um, also looking to maximize from a from a, uh, an example would be they have a laser a laser cutting um, steel machine that they use to make very specific cuts for the inputs to their fixtures um, so that they can minimize the amount of waste so it's not it's they weren't selected to be necessarily an extreme example but that they showed elements of this archetype okay. and do they do they assess that up and down the value chain or just mostly within the more immediate operations? Yeah, no, absolutely. So some of the other examples that they shared as part of the interview of how they um, assess other areas of the value chain, so they, as much as they can, um, so some of their elements are sourced from overseas, but otherwise they look at doing as much local sourcing as possible. Um, one, to support the community and that they're doing business, but also to minimize like, transportation and logistics costs. Um, another example, it, it actually didn't come up in the um, interview I did, but in doing some research after, they um, also recognized that they wanted to reduce their shipping costs to the US. Um, so they actually then found shipping in batches instead of doing individual shipments um, would benefit them um, from a cost standpoint. I don't know if they also looked at what the environmental impact of that was, um, but they do absolutely look at all areas um, within the within their chain. Um, another example is um, uh, Enerlight. So um, Brian Gold, who's the representative um, for Del Biro from there. Um, another aspect is as they're say they're retrofitting a building, they'll actually look at what is the what are the materials that they're taking out. So what are the like what's contained in the old lighting um, systems, um, and they'll actually then make sure that those are being disposed of um, 
for that company in, uh, um, in a responsible way, and that elements that can be recycled are recycled. So that's another, another um, aspect of how they're looking at it. But I, mean, I think we have to recognize that we're still at the stage where all the patterns frameworks that are out there, including the one that will get presented next week, next month, sorry, are still all based on assessments of existing organizations. And since we don't have any organizations that are yet future fit, we don't have any way of assessing but in these extended, you know, the extended questions. But I have to say, I'm, I'm, given that we also know that any company that tries to do all those things wouldn't be viable today because of all kinds of different reasons, uh, it strikes me this is an amazing example. And it's just the first one. And it's just the first one. <laughs> Yeah, they were very, they were a very impressive company to talk to. So another um, very impressive company um, that's also based here in um, Ontario is called Sawmill Sid Inc. So um, Sheila Story, who was featured in the quote from earlier, um, and her husband uh, uh, run the company. And essentially, they were running a home in the early 2000s. They were running a home construction um, company, and they realized that there was a lot of wood um, that was going to waste. And they specifically saw that there was a lot of urban wood um, that was an opportunity that was being kind of hauled away. You can see what, so if a tree falls down during a storm as we recently had in Toronto, it falls down, it gets um, carted away to typically a, a municipal lot um, where then they wait for it to accumulate. And then typically what will then happen or as happens in um, the GTA is then they bring in processors and it gets mulched and unfortunately then um, in, in many cases that mulch will go to a landfill where it decomposes. Some of it may be used for landscaping and other uses but in a lot of a lot of cases it actually just goes to landfill um, and so they recognized that there was a, a unique opportunity with um, creating a business model around this um, and that's what brings me to um, and you, so as you can see from the framework here, they are the most, and you'll see more examples from them, so they're the most proactive and radical um, mm -hmm. model of, of all of the cases. Um, so the focus for the second example is on um, creating value from waste. So a very unique aspect actually that um, urban wood as it grows uh, in cities and other places, it has more constraints and stress on it than you know, trees that grow naturally in the forest. And so that actually creates these very kind of complex um, patterns and twists and things. And so they saw that as being an advantage for things like live edge tables and cutting boards. Um, and so these are the types of products um, that they then <coughs> turn um, the wood that they recover um, into. And so just a little bit more background on their process. So they've worked with um, cities like Toronto, um, and other places to, um, instead of the city paying someone to come and take that wood away, in some cases they will actually buy it um, from the city. Um, they actually now have a joint um, project um, in Toronto working with um, the municipality where they are receiving the wood um, and they have a, a wood lot recovery center. Um, but in it, so in addition to recovering the wood and then doing um, saw milling at the location that they have, they also do portable saw milling. So that's actually a way to lower the impact versus having to transport the very heavy um, logs to a central location to have them saw milled. They can actually go onto location, have them saw milled, and then people can come buy it directly from that site or it can go where it needs to go directly from that site. Um, and then in addition, um, versus, or, um, beyond just the wood that they then sell um, to you know, carpenters or homeowners who want to use it. Um, they've also donated um, some of the wood to projects like uh, one that was called Buddy Bench. So they donated wood to schools and the schools then created um, these benches where they were supposed to, they were a safe place. So if you didn't have anyone to kind of hang out with at recess or lunch, you could go and sit on that bench and then it was a signal for other people to come and join you. Um, so it's this whole buddy bench concept um, that they help support through um, their business model as well. Um, another example, um, so that was the 2A I wanted to share as well. So um, moving now to one of the first companies from Quebec um, is a company called Polyform. 
um, and they are a designer and manufacturer of um, quality plastic solutions. Um, they have four different divisions, um, an industrial division, an insulation division, an environmental division, and a helmet division. Um, they started in the 1970s as a wood products company, and they still continue to involve, uh, continue to evolve. Um, one of their most recent evolutions was actually creating the polyvert um, recycling um, now as as one of the um, one of their um, vertical integrations um, for the company. Um, and so they were also a great example of the archetype of maximizing. Um, or sorry, of creating value from waste. And uh, I discovered after I had done the research, they actually have a um, fantastic video that talks more about the company and how they think about it. Um, so I will just switch to that briefly and let you watch that. And so give you a break from me talking. Better product, but have a negative impact on the I don't call that innovation. Innovating with sustainable solutions and a complete life cycle, that's real innovation. And that's something that sets us apart. People have this perception that polystyrene can't be recycled. It's not true. EPS is recyclable. The product's reputation was part of the problem, but polystyrene is really a good product when it's used in the right places. It's not that it can be recycled. It's figuring out what comes next with the eco centers, and some steps have already been made. We've made it our mission to make expanded polystyrene recycling accessible. First, we started with our own waste. I would say around 2006. We invested in special equipment. We created a whole environment division, and the demand is keen. It's so popular, we're now investing in a brand new sorting center that will double our current capacity. New spread and now extended polystyrene can also be collected at our customers' customers and at our distributors. We put a drop-off point in the parking lot of the office and we see people pulling up there every day, actually every hour. When they're driving by, they stop and they drop off their polystyrene packaging. I find it encouraging and it gives me hope because we can say, yes, we're going to get this done there will be a system put in place to provide a service that matches the needs. One of our main applications is in the Nudurak insulated concrete form. These are the forms that concrete is poured in to build houses, malls, schools, hospitals, or hotels. The plastic we process are used to make inserts for these forms. We need you. We need everyone's help. In order to make sure we are leaving our future generations a healthy, clean world where they can enjoy living. It's important to make these efforts because every little gesture has a much bigger impact than you might think. <coughs> Hopefully folks online were able to hear that as well as see it. Do people donate the... Yes, we were able to hear it. Perfect, Thanks. good. Um, what, so they've put a collection box out so people can drop off um, the styrofoam. So one of the challenges um, that they have is that not all municipalities would um, collect it and be able to process it. So they wanted to have some ways for people to actually drop it off. If you go onto their website, there's a map um, that shows all over um, Quebec what all the different locations are for it to be dropped off. On the industrial side, um, I'm not aware if they actually pay to get it back or not. Um, they didn't, as it is mentioned in the video, they'll take it back from their customers' customers to put it back into their um, into the value stream. But I'm not, I'm not actually aware if they're paying for it or it's all just coming back um, for free. And is it all their own, or is it other? Other manufacturers. Other, yes, other manufacturers um, sorry, own products as well. Yeah, this one is interesting. And well, there's another example of a company that uses styrofoam as well. Um, and I think it's it's an interesting example because they talk about the fact that there is a negative perception associated with styrofoam in general, but it's actually a very efficient material um, because of the actual um, amount of um, 
the amount of product that's in a piece of styrofoam is actually only about 2% of the total volume and the rest of it's air. So it's actually a fairly efficient um, material, but it does have, I think, challenges in that it's not broadly um, recyclable. Which brings us to the next example. So another example um, of a Quebec-based company called Dynapack. Um, they are one of the um, they're one of the largest providers of styrofoam food packaging. They have about 125 employees at the time of the research, and they're also started um, in the 1970s, and they're based in Laval um, in Quebec. <coughs> they offer three different types of styrofoam containers. So they're Dynapack, which are their traditional styrofoam containers, um, the Azura, um, which contain anywhere between 12 and 20% recycled um, materials, and then their um, nature product, um, which I will talk a bit more about. So for this example, I'm focusing on how they found a way to substitute naturals and renewables as part of their process. So as I mentioned, um, styrofoam um, products have a, um, you know, challenges and that they're not broadly able to be um, recycled. So what the general manager of Dynapack um, did was to work with um, two other um, companies, um, both in the U.S., um, to develop a industrial compostable um, styrofoam product. Um, so this was a uh, new, brand new to the world technology um, that they partnered with um, to develop so that they could offer this to their customers. Um, what's very interesting, though, is that they recognize um, a couple of, of you know, challenges with um, like marketing this product and having it become more mainstream. Um, they they you know, recognize that they're probably about, at, well, at the time of the research, um, which was almost two years ago now, they felt like they were at least five years ahead of, of the marketplace um, in that they do expect there will be both a customer and consumer demand for it. But right now, that, um, that demand doesn't necessarily outweigh the additional cost. It does come with a, an increased cost versus the basic product. And then the second um, challenge as well is that not, not many, um, there's not many uh, industrial composting facilities that exist in order to compost it. So it's not, um, it, unless you had a very active um, home composting system, a very advanced home composting system, then it, it's, it's not really designed to work in those um, environments. It's really meant to be in more of an industrial system where it gets the right level of, of um, kind of attention and that has the right, um, I guess, like environment for it to, to biodegrade. Um, they do see though that there's positive things happening on that front with places like Washington and California. Um, and that's where sometimes there can be trends um, um, in recycling that can then spread across the rest of the company or company or rest of um, um, North America. So they do expect that more municipalities will start to have more um, environments that will make this um, more feasible for them to have it be more broad spread. So I thought this was really cool because it's um, you know, a great example of where companies you know, looking ahead and saying, how do we really kind of future-proof ourselves and develop a completely new product? That brings us to another example, um, Aslan Technologies. So Aslan is a Burlington-based water and wastewater um, treatment um, company. They, at the time of the research, had about 25 employees. They were founded in 1992. In, um, they um, serve multiple different um, customers with their products and services. So they um, focus on innovation, design, and build of custom solutions um, across those two areas. Um, and they have various customers from municipalities, military, NGOs, embassies, um, residential um, and industrial. So they um, are my example of functionality versus ownership, which is the fourth um, sustainable business model um, archetype. Um, so a really interesting example um, that they shared with me is that they'll work with a, um, a customer and de design um, a custom-built solution for them 
And if that means that it requires um, like a finance, a different financing option, so if it's being rented or it's being leased, um, then that's something that they can partner with the customer on um, developing. They can also create temporary solutions. Um, and then because they are the primary manufacturer, then they can actually take the systems back and either then release them or rent them to someone else, or they can break down the parts and reincorporate them back into a new system. So one of the um, examples that they um, gave of where they have done some of this type of work where they've had to use um, different types of um, you know, financing and, and ownership models um, is with First Nations communities in Canada and being able to provide systems to provide clean drinking water. Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting um, example of um, how they're having a, um, a specific impact by building that flexibility into um, the business that they're doing. The next um, example comes from Calstone. So Calstone is, I think, one of the most innovative manufacturing companies um, <laughs> in Canada um, and is really at, I think, the forefront of looking at um, all aspects of their operations and looking at how they can minimize um, their impact. Um, at the time of the research, they had about 55 employees. They were founded in 1985 and they're based in Scarborough, which is outside of Toronto. Um, they are completely off the grid in that they take no um, additional water from municipal sources. They um, derive all their energy from wind and solar sources and they produce um, zero waste. Um, they, yes, <laughs> um, they have a, um, a, you know, they have a philosophy of taking a full cradle to cradle approach with their manufacturing um, operations. Um, so they are um, my example for adopting a stewardship role. So um, as I mentioned earlier on in the um, introduction um, with the companies who are willing to you know, participate and be a part of this research, um, Calstone really stands out as being an organization that not only takes how they incorporate sustainability into their operations very seriously, but they also dedicate time and energy to sharing it with industry associations, creating cases, um, working with other um, folks from Partners in Project Green. Um, so the founder, um, Jim, will, has the, as we we're doing the research, I got great examples of where he would personally talk to other um, leaders and other companies and help them create business cases for incorporating sustainability as part of their um, company. So it was one great example of where he was able to help another company make a business case for installing a green roof. Um, and then Cindy, who's also featured here, um, so part of her role in addition to business development, um, she takes an active role in really telling the Calstone story about all of the work that they're doing um, around sustainability. Um, just to go back for a second. Uh, What's their product? Yeah, so they make industrial off they make um, industrial office furniture. So things like uh, so traditional office furniture, but also packing stations. So you can see here. So now that the e-commerce industry is growing significantly, um, there's you know this uh, segment of the market around having these packing stations for people to package and ship things out. Um, some of the images here are where they converted some um, land outside of their um, plant site into a um, into a pond to help with capturing um, rainwater and also filtering um, water naturally outside the site. And then they also have so they have also selected the types of plants um, and things for that plant for that site to that were specifically. Um, known for helping to filter out um, things that could be um, contaminants. Um, they also have plants um, inside their manufacturing um, facility as well, and they specifically picked those um, because they were known for being the best for air filtration as well. So uh, this is really curious because are, are, is Calstone um, doing manufacturing so they can be sustainable? Like, did they pick a product? That they knew they could do under the constraints no. or did they start saying we want to make steel office furniture and can we do it sustainably yes so really wow yes. yeah okay. so they evolved um they evolved into their current um 
embracing of sustainability. Um, and so, and I'll go to the next example as well, which is I also using Calstone and it's on encouraging sufficiency. So um, back in 2006, um, York University had um, some of the Calstone products um, on site and requested that Calstone actually take them back. And so they, they um, used that as a trigger to think about how do we create a remanufacturing program? Why wouldn't we want to take these products back? and then see if we can either reincorporate them into our products or ensure that they are um, being recycled properly. Um, and so you can, you know, um, people frequently move offices or change layouts and things. And so it's a, it's a common occurrence that you would have kind of extra um, pieces of office furniture. It can get worn out. So they will actually take it back. They assess all of the different pieces um, that come back and see how they can either be reincorporated um, directly into products or um, if they're you know, kind of beyond being um, recycled or reused, then they actually do um, sell, the, sell um, the pieces to another recycling company to be recycled. Yeah. So yeah, to your, your question, they didn't necessarily start out saying, let's have a completely sustainable business model or um, in that aspect. But I think it was really the vision of the founder um, in that it is a family business that he not only wanted to pass on um, the business to the next generation, but also wanted to make sure that he was passing on a business that was having a, a positive impact. So they really embraced, you know, what are all of the things that we can do? How do we get completely off the grid? And then they started working towards making that happen um, and um, leverage some of some things like partners, like Partners in Project Green um, for grants and other things um, in order to make it happen. But yes, they, have, they evolved there, which I think is awesome. <coughs> the next example is from um, Quebec again, and it is a company that um, makes HDPE um, pipes for irrigation um, and um, like water transfer. Um, and they've also evolved to um, have fully integrated recycling as part of their operations. And this is my example for them of um, the seventh sustainable business model archetype, which is inclusive value creation. So Salino had been working to um, incorporate, they incorporate recycled um, materials into their pipes. One of their suppliers um, was employing people with um, mental and physical uh, disabilities, and they were having financial challenges. So they actually decided to buy um, that company so that they could help those people keep their jobs um, because it was also an important way for them to vertic vertically integrate because they needed to, to keep having that source of um, recycled plastics. Um, they were able to actually um, go in and help improve the overall operations um, of the recycling um, um, organization and actually go from just having one shift to having three shifts um, and actually in, like increase the overall output um, of what they were doing. And so this still <coughs> main, this is still a key part of, um, of their operations um, now to this day. I come back to Sawmill Sid for the last two um, sustainable business model archetypes. Um, and I give, gave them a big green star uh, because they are the only um, one of the cases who I classified all of their um, archetypes as being both um, proactive and radical. Um, and so there's two more examples um, that I'll bring. So one is repurposing the business um, for society or for the environment. So Sawmill Sid, um, above and beyond any of the other case companies, really does um, you know, see their role as being to um, minimize the environmental impact, to proactively capture carbon. They talk about the ability of keeping um, the trees, that you know, trees spend their lives capturing carbon for us, but then if we cut them down and end up mulching them and that then it gets released back into the environment. And so um, keeping it in it captured in um, wood products um, that we need to use anyways is a way to help um, benefit the environment. 
um, but they also take a you know very strong role in things like education. So they will go into companies, they will go into schools, um, they host people frequently um, on their site to um, provide education around um, how they can um, capture carbon and about the impact of um, you know what happens with um, urban wood. Um, so they really do take it, take the whole um, idea of the purpose of their business um, very seriously about being for um, a greater purpose. And then the last of the sustainable business model archetypes is about um, scale up solutions. So this one I found very interesting because as I was interviewing um, all of the companies, none of the um, none of the companies felt that their efforts to scale, so to grow their businesses or to expand, um, were kind of novel enough to fit the criteria um, of this. So I mentioned there was a lot that had, you know, very high growth and things, but they didn't necessarily feel like their efforts of scaling um, met the criteria of a sustainable business model innovation. Um, Sawmill SIDS um, kind of vision for scaling absolutely does. So versus them becoming like a national um, type company with locations um, in various um, areas, they would like other people locally to adopt their model. Um, and so they, enc they encourage other people to share information um, and would like to see other locals, local um, um, providers of the same types of services that they are providing, um, you know, grow across the country and in other places. Um, so that vision really, I think, does fit with um, a kind of the sustainable business model archetype of um, a sustainable way to um, scale up. Because as I mentioned, because of the, the portable nature of the um, sawmilling business, then there really is that benefit of it being very locally based. Um, they see you know, benefits to other people in their communities taking on a similar um, type of model. So they are really very exemplary um in you know in their, in their full approach um and i think you know stand out from the research again they are one of the newer and smaller organizations as well though so they perhaps you know had the opportunity to from an early um time in their in their organization to you know look at all the different ways that they could um, make sure that they were incorporating um elements of uh, the archetypes across their business um, so a few key kind of conclusions and insights. So that was um, all the nine archetypes and then examples from seven of the eight um, companies. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, as, as I've kind of shared, their elements of sustainability um, truly are part of their business model. And there is fundamentally a business case where they've been um, incorporated um, in, in many of, of the cases. So either there's been potential to have funding, there's a market opportunity, there's a vertical integration opportunity, um, there's some type of a competitive advantage that can be derived, but fundamentally there needs to be a business case um, behind what um, is happening to incorporate these types of um, sustainability initiatives. The foresight of the owner manager of the SME to identify the opportunities for innovation and future business are critical, especially in the radical and proactive examples, which you know a lot of the examples are. Um, so I really, do, I really, um, you know, can't um, say enough about the the vision of a lot of the founders of whether it's you know the legacy that they want to leave or a business opportunity that they see um, in driving. Um, you know, what shapes um, how these organizations have gone, even if it's not an owner, but then in some cases, um, an early founder of the organization would hire someone who is very um, like-minded, um, who would then, you know, help drive that out within the organization. So Cindy would be a great example from Calstone, who um, is, not, is not necessarily a, you know, family member as part of the family business, but she's absolutely been critical to helping um, drive forward their sustainability agenda. And she was part of why she was hired was specifically to do that. And then finally, collaboration with industry partners and other companies, um, you know, it can be a key enabler. So there was examples like with Dynapack where they needed to go outside of their own expertise to find other partners um, in the US to help develop that new technology that they needed. Um, Calstone has worked with you know, partners in Project Green and many others to get 
um, whether it's funding or expertise um, for their own projects, but then also to share what those examples are. Um, but I think the interesting thing as well is that even when there's not, you know, a, um, a partner or a specific solution, um, the more radical and um, proactive companies have gone out and created their own solutions. Um, so just to summarize, so back to where, you know, the research all started, I know I, I found as I was um, assessing the landscape, there was a lot of focus on what are the barriers to sustainability in SMEs and wanted to you know, share more um, practical real world examples um, from some um, really exciting companies um, to create these kind of uh, more of a how to or a, at least the what um, of what's going on um, to give some inspiration to um, build momentum. Um, they obviously, you know, given their size and resources, face many constraints, but there are, you know, networks, peers, and the ability to leverage collaboration to overcome that. Um, the importance of leadership, um, as I mentioned before, can't be um, underestimated. Um, so either having senior management buy-in or just having in, having in general the people who are running the business um, being the ones who are driving it forward is absolutely critical. Um, and then the um, business case obviously needs to be um, uh, the number one criteria. Um, maybe not necessarily at the beginning, but needs to be a part of um, what makes it as the overall business model sustainable, um, especially in the manufacturing industry. In a lot of cases, there are very um, thin margins. Um, there's a lot of international competition, um, which was something else that was mentioned earlier. And so they don't, these, in this industry especially, there's not really the luxury of having um, the ability to, um, you know, have a lot of flexibility about making um, like strategic but not uh, financially um, responsible decisions. So, um, and I think these companies are a great example um, of making sure that they're doing that. Um, and that's because I think ultimately if it's not a part of their core operations, um, it won't necessarily be able to be sustained. Wow. Um, I know it's a lot. It was a lot. It's fantastic. It's great. Yeah, really good. Um, so, so Bob, that uh, those last two points on Katie's last slide, maybe you could just go back one slide, um, uh, is, uh, is very interesting. And I was wondering, do you, would you like to ask a follow up question on either <laughs> of those two po question, points, Bob? Yeah, the, the stories are great for every one of the uh, cases that Katie talked about. Um, and you alluded to the fact that they were uh, cost justified in some way, um, but it didn't sound like the purpose of your study was to document that part of it. It was more a classification of the, yeah. the business models that they were using rather than trying to uh, show how they supported their innovation with good monetized justification for doing it. Even though you didn't look at that, did you get the sense that that, that really was there, that they didn't do anything that they couldn't um, prove to themselves and others was a, a smart thing to do, saving money, making money, tapping into markets, whatever? Yeah. Um, in many of the cases, there was like a clear, there was a clear cost savings um, associated with some of the things that they were doing. Um, but not in all of them. So, um, for example, you know, in my discussions with Calstone, they talked about how having some grant funding was critical to being able to implement some of the things that they wanted to do. Um, now, you know, whether or not they would have gone ahead ultimately and done them anyways, potentially it would have been on a longer time horizon. That part I'm not sure of, but that was um, that was a factor for them being able to, to get some of the things done that they were able to implement was having things like grant funding um, to do it. So there was, you know, there was clear cost savings examples where I think it was easy, it was easier to justify. And then there were some examples where grants um, were also critical to being able to implement things. Were there cases where the company found that they had to get to a certain scale, a certain size before something became cost effective? Um, did they have that? 
I don't remember that spe that specific element coming up necessarily, um, but I definitely understand where you're coming from. Of you know, if they're if they're just starting out, would they be would they be putting um, additional stress or constraint on themselves by trying to implement things when they were just starting? There, there might yeah. be some manufacturing yeah. process that's sustainable and cost effective if it's large enough. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. The other um, dynamic as well, especially with smaller companies, is if the fourth bullet down, the uh, the management buy-in is there, and it's their idea, and it's something which they feel fairly strongly they want to do, yes. a lot of the business case is really kind of retroactively rationalizing something they've already decided to do, yep. and they don't necessarily add up all of the uh, Absolutely. benefits to support it. They'll just point to something which looks like they're saving money, but they don't kind of show that it's necessarily enough. If the idea were coming from the outside, or if the, if the idea were coming from ranks perhaps lower in the organization, uh, the need for the business case might be a little bit more rigorous. Absolutely, yep. Yep, no, I absolutely agree with that. And that's why, that's where I think the, either the owner manager um, you know having that vision or having those ideas or then hiring in people who share um, who share that vision is critical but I, I agree and I mean I'm sure there's other research that's been done about what's the type of rigor of financial analysis that happens in SMEs um, and it's um, it's you know there's likely some opportunities on that front like it's probably not being done as much as we would um, we would necessarily think it is. Yeah. yeah and then it, that's the way they make a lot of decisions, right? They, they just do them. Um, yeah. And if it's working, then they don't really second guess themselves. Mm -hmm. It's usually though, when, when somebody who is not in charge is making the suggestion that the need for a more rigorous quantified business case is higher mm -hmm. in importance. Yeah. One interesting example that this makes me think of is with Dynapack. So the general manager, um, part of the process innovation that he um, had implemented, um, in addition to this fantastic, um, you know, industrial industrially biodegradable um, styrofoam product that they came up with, is that he also talked about how they tried to have what he called an inverted. Um, an inverted triangle of management where he wanted all of the power to essentially be um, with the employees, both to empower them to come up with solutions for their customers, um, but then also to be the ones to come up with the innovation um, in the organization. So that was something that he had shared um, overtly with me as one of, um, of their, their objectives. So I think there's also examples where you've got a leader in an organization who has a vision, but then sees the benefit of getting everyone in the organization enrolled in it. Um, and that can also, I think, be, um, be very powerful. So it can be uh, the owner, manager, leader driving it forward, or they can have like more of an emergent um, philosophy around you know, encouraging other people to also participate in that vision. mentioned um cindy at calstone yes. as the person her job is to tell the story part of her job part of her yeah. job yeah um just so in general what, what did you see certain trends and how they actually shared stories in terms of either they issued reports mm -hmm. or just told it in a more organic way or yeah. any yeah. any insight there um so they um they have um their website where she writes a blog where she provides regular updates on things that are going on and then also when they're doing any types of special events or things and she'll also get media and press um, involved as well um, but I think it's it brings up a great point because I think we typically think of you know of having some type of an annual report or a sustainability report or something um, and I don't um, at least at the time of when I did this research, none of the organizations had like a formal sustainability report that we would see from like a larger, like publicly traded um, company um, because they're private and they don't have those same types of reporting um, requirements um, that we um, spoke about before the session began. So 
um, yeah, it's, it was really more of, um, I'm probably not doing justice to all of um, Cindy's efforts of getting their message out there, but it's like their blog, their website, um, you know, media coverage. I think Sawmill Sid's also been very successful in getting um, Sheila from Sawmill Sid in getting um, broadcast coverage. So they're regularly featured um, in um, you know, news reports and different things by leveraging their media connections. Um, but I don't believe any of the organizations, they might now, but I don't believe that came up as part of the research. They had a formal sustainability report. Um, and did they, um, uh, any of them talk about investors? I presume they all have investors out there and going down these roads mm -hmm. towards radical and uh, proactive yeah. initiatives. To what extent did they talk about needing to bring along the investors as well? Yeah, um, that actually didn't really come up. Um, so yes, absolutely. I imagine um, several of the organizations likely have, you know, outside um, financing or outside investors, but that did not come up necessarily as a major barrier to, um, you know, what the initiatives were that they were executing. It could also be that, you know, because my line of, my line of questioning and the way my questionnaire was designed, I didn't I didn't ask about, you know, how has your board reacted or how have your um, investors reacted to some of the initiatives that you're making? Um, if I think of like in the situations where it's a like a family owned um, company, then they likely don't have outside um, investment. In fact, um, I think several of the companies, um, which was also, you know, could be a whole other um, kind of tangent of research as well as um, they've grown without outside investment. Um, and so I think that likely gives them more flexibility, um, which I think is a bit behind your question as well of not necessarily then having to um, to justify the, the work that they're doing um, to outside investors. Um, then they likely would be more of a business case and potentially the effort of putting that together might be enough to deter <laughs> some of the efforts um, in and of itself. Some of them seem to have a real commitment to um, sort of public education. And, uh, and so I wondered how that was expressed or uh, in terms of a plan or how they allocate resources to it. But that's, a, that's something that we're just not seeing all that much in the larger organizations, a real commitment to public education, consumer education. Specifically around like what they're doing and around sustainability. Yes, yeah. around the role that the yeah. consumer plays in this and the, the, uh, the sense of partnership mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in something. Yeah, yeah. just the other companies are doing different forms of corporate social responsibility and environmental sustainability might need more CSR effort from large companies. Yeah, yeah I mean, Sawmill is a fantastic example where they, I mean, that is part of their, part of their whole um, you know, mission is, you know, how do we, how do we educate? How do we get school groups to come in? How do we go into companies? So they take that part, um, they take that part very seriously. Um, but on the, your question of, you know, how do they think about expressing that or allocating resources to it? That part, um, I didn't get into as much, but, um, there's, I'm sure there's opportunity to, um, if you're interested in following up with any of them, I can always, well, I'm interested in the cultural yeah. sort of side, so yeah. I'm really interested in that. How do you mobilize the public into really feeling mm. like they're part of it? And for Samuel Sid's idea of actually encouraging um, similar kinds of organizations to pop up in communities, that would be totally in line with that. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm Kelly, and I, and I happen to speak to Sid at the Green Living Show, and I think he did a great job of drawing me into something that I, uh, his booth itself didn't, uh, I, I didn't understand it, and, and so we had a wonderful conversation, and s certainly part of his educational process, he had a lot of people, um, uh, consumers at the show, that he was able to demonstrate how in taking uh, trees and making them down into, um, uh, compost, if you will, had less CEO uh, uh, contribution than keeping a higher value in, in the larger wood. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciated uh, his time to talk uh, to me about it, and he was also had the opportunity to speak to um, 
the Mayor John Tory, and that was one of the, um, uh, I guess, it led to Toronto um, giving them their business. It, I don't know if that was something that you found when you interviewed them originally, if it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, absolutely. The whole, I, they have a great way, I think, of um, bringing to life the concept of how the carbon gets captured. And you think about that, that's the job of trees, is they're really helping to capture carbon. And then the idea that then it goes and gets, <laughs> then it goes and gets released when it, when it gets, that was, that was something for me that I had not, I had not personally before I, you know, embarked on this research had really understood fully um, that process. So I know they were at the Green Living Show. I was unfortunately away um, and didn't get a chance to go and stop by, but that's, a, so there's another perfect example. So they had a booth at the Green Living Show, um, which was held a few weeks ago um, here in Toronto, um, so that they can, you know, share their message and, and what they're doing from an education standpoint. So that's another perfect, uh, another perfect example. Thank you, Kelly, for, for mentioning that. A question from one of the uh, participants online. Um, were any of the companies using a company-wide sustainability management system? And if so, were there any insights in this regard? Were any of the companies using any business modeling processes that you're aware of? If so, what came up around these? No formal sustainability management systems that I'm aware of. Um, some of the larger organizations could potentially be. I, I mean, an organization like um, like Polyform, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they have more, more <coughs> formal um, you know, reporting systems and also ways of thinking about innovation and, and management practices in general, because they're they are very sophisticated, um, but not that came up as part of this. So no one mentioned, you know, this is a formal process that we use for it, or there's a specific management system. Um, and again, no one, the concept of business, the concept of business model innovation um, was something that was that I was sharing as a new concept of, as I was doing the research. So it wasn't something that people were saying, yes, you know, we're you know we're always thinking about how do we you know evolve, um, involve um, or incorporate sustainability as as part of our business model. It wasn't necessarily part of the um, terminology that people were using. Now whether they, but there's I mean it's obvious as you see the examples that they are doing um, innovation at the business model level. But I just think it was a way that it was it was translated. So I think that would be a different kind of line of questioning to try and understand more about the the ways that they're they're thinking about doing it. But there was no like no one unfortunately there was no like business model canvas type right, pieces right. that came to life or things like that. Um, w was even the idea that they were designing rather than planning their business was that? in their language or current nope. no okay no. um and um i mean so many of these companies it would seem would score well on the b impact assessment uh obviously this was done 18 months ago two years okay. ago and so even in the canadian context it wasn't so well known then was did that come up with any of those companies at all absolutely so one of the companies um was going through the process to become a certified b corp and they went through the full process and then decided at the end for um, legal and tax reasons not to go ahead with it. But they met all of the criteria in the spirit of what it was, but B Corp is a different corporation um, structure. And so I think the feedback from their, the feedback from their legal um, and tax um, advisors was that um, it, could, it was not, not necessarily the best um, model for them to use, but without kind of, formalizing in that way they still incorporate all right, the different elements right, of it right, right. yeah <clears throat> but that was one of the follow-ups i did um, in preparation for this research was to follow up with that company to see if they had achieved it um, and then they gave me the feedback that they'd been advised not to to complete it and and did, did had the others heard of it and they decided not to or they hadn't heard of it um i don't to be honest i don't remember if i explicitly asked um, about it. This company proactively, they, they were already going through the process of initiating it when I started the research. Right, right. Um, but I don't, I don't believe I explicitly asked the other companies if they were aware of um, the B Corp model. Very good. Any other closing questions? Just a, a quick one on the management system and the planning part. Did you sense that they had set goals for themselves or, or targets that they had um, 
aspirations to try to meet within some time frame. You mentioned that there was one company, I think it was Kelstone, that was off the grid in terms of water and electricity and waste and so on. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not they ever said, okay, we're going to be that way and work towards it, that's another question. But th did other companies have um, that kind of goal that they were working towards? Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, Calstone had that as a stated goal that then they worked um, towards and looked for ways to implement so they could, um, like implementing their wind and solar. Um, there was even... So uh, even a specific example they showed me when I was able to tour their facility that they found a way to have um, all of their grounds were um, watered naturally with rainwater, but there was hedges on the front of their building that the, um, the awning of the building actually blocked from them getting watered naturally with the rainwater. So they redesigned the um, awning so that it would funnel the water so that it would go down and actually water those hedges because they, they thought we either have to get rid of the hedges or we have to figure out a way that they can also um, be watered naturally. So they absolutely set that goal and then through <coughs> right through to, you know, the, those types of, of details, they found ways to make it work. And they, you know, as a manufacturing company had had had, you know, someone within the company um, design these metal um, parts for the awning to to be able to enable um, that to happen. Um, in other, terms of the other companies, did you sense that they had big, hairy, audacious goals that they had set for themselves that were sparking some of the innovation that you were seeing? Not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. I think in some cases there there were um, goals. So our Dynapack would be another great example. I think they rec they recognized that the, the, you know, the core of their business was something that was going to become more of a challenge um, for the future. And so they wanted to create, they wanted to create that new product line to, you know, future proof themselves. So I think there's a, there's another example of where they had, you know, a specific goal of let's create um, this type of product. And then they, they then made it happen. Um, but I don't remember explicitly other organizations saying, you know, you know, we want to reduce our um, our energy consumption by X percent by this date, and those working towards it, those in those types of ways. Um, Sawmill SID does ca um, track closely all of the carbon that they help to capture um, through their um, through their business process. Um, they may have. I'd have to um, go and and do some more research to see. Do they have some a type of a goal that they're trying to reach, or do they just track their progress? Um, but, uh, um, no, I wouldn't say like on balance, um, that the, you know, not that the majority of the companies had like a stated goal and they were working towards it. The Calstone is a great example of where they absolutely did. And, and they are one of the more, um, innovative examples. It, 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 they tie it, it, back to the uh, question of reporting and if they're not going to be reporting publicly, then they don't need to do as much of that as some of the, the other companies that do those public reports want to be able to show. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it, it just it strikes me, Bob, that, it, it, you know, when, when you've got companies who are demonstrating this much leadership compared to <coughs> more typical organizations, and yet we can still see how much more they could be doing. I mean, how much of their, if, if they were backcasting against mm -hmm. future fit, how much smarter could they be about making the investments in the near term innovations, which both help short-term financial viability and enhance their competitive position with a long-term view. It just, it, it's, uh, I mean, we don't know the, that's, that's, that's the hypothesis we have, that if you did that, that right. those outcomes would be possible. Um, but it's interesting to see that even the leaders aren't doing, uh, are doing it in a more, I think ad hoc would be a little unkind. I think it's more intentional than that. But it's yeah, it, it's it, it's a good reminder to us that there are a lot of different dynamics in play, and you don't yeah. necessarily have to have all of the pins in place that we feel so strongly about for good yeah. things to happen. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that's. I, mean, I think that this is a good uh, a good examples that if it can't. If it can't be measured, it can't be done. Clearly, these companies are not focused on the, uh, the measurements or, or capturing the metrics. I and agree. that piece of administration it is oftentimes the bureaucracy is just so overwhelming that, that people are just busy trying to get their work done. 
<laughs> they just do it. <laughs> so, so I think we have uh, Morris uh, Fidelli. He's online. It's very early in the morning for Morris. It's uh, he's in the Philippines. Uh, Morris, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I'm actually working on a similar study uh, involving M&As uh, instead, the multinationals. But uh, my question is, insofar as the organizations that you were working with, uh, Katie, mm -hmm. did you find that, I mean, you have answered just in the last comment you made that they weren't keeping any sort of metrics and so forth. And so far as the ones that were keeping some form of metrics, were they doing it in a, my question is, were they doing it in a context sort of based way or um, or your answer is basically none of them were really keeping any sort of metrics in this regard? Well, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say they weren't keeping metrics. Um, the original question was, did they set a, like a big audacious goal and then try and work towards that specifically? I think across all of these organizations, um, they are absolutely, um, you know, tracking different aspects of like financial measures. Samil said this is tracking their, their carbon capture and I'm sure other measures in terms of their social impact. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say they're not, they're not um, looking to track the type of progress that they're doing. I, don't, I just don't think my research um, was comprehensive in capturing those elements of it, but I would absolutely um, believe that the, the, the organizations are capturing those types of measures, um, especially some of the larger sophisticated ones out of Quebec. Um, I'm sure that they absolutely have very specific goals that they've set and they would be tracking against those. But I just, I didn't see the same types of, I think, versus larger, um, like public organizations setting like a, you know, by, you know, 2030, these are the types of goals we would want to have. I think that part was less formalized, but I think as they do make progress, they've been in a lot of cases able to then show, hey, here's what we have done. Um, here's the progress that we've made. My, my question was more in relation to whether they were keeping, uh, I mean, whether they're tracking in a context-based way, in other words, relative to some sort of allocation of resources, whatever resource was being measured. That was really the, the key part of my question. That, I, that part, um, again, I didn't ask specifically, um, so I can't really speak to okay. it. But um, I, uh, I think we, we, we likely would overestimate the, um, that level of sophistication happening in an organization, frankly, like resource allocation, um, even in larger organizations, I think is, is sometimes um, a bit of a challenge. And so I don't know if they, they're doing that type of resource allocation plus looking at what the amount is that's being um, dedicated to sustainability initiatives, but again, I can't, I didn't ask that specifically, so I can't comment specifically for these cases. Well, I guess it rather makes um, sense because you're per, you know, predominantly dealing with SME, uh, smaller sort of enterprises with the sort of limited sort of resources and the like, yes. compared to like with multinationals, which would have a little bit more capability in this regard. Uh, anyhow, you've answered my question. Thanks for that. And uh, I'm going to make that the last uh, question since we're now over the hour and I was not paying attention. So I apologize for my poor timekeeping here. Uh, so th thank you very much, Katie, for a really excellent presentation. Very pleased that uh, you were able to make it today. Um, there, there was actually going to be two presentations today. Uh, and I'm actually very happy that we only had one. Uh, and uh, it's because we were able to go into it in much more depth. But uh, I'm going to try and reschedule another student of Nancy's. Um, uh, Martin, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce Martin's surname accurately, um, who's d also done some very interesting work, uh, which uh, I want to get shared with the group. So uh, we'll we'll reschedule that hopefully uh, in the fall sometime. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, next month, uh, we have uh, one of the long-term members of the group, uh, Dr. Florian Ludecker Freud, and uh, his graduate student, uh, Sarah Carew, uh, presenting on their new work on patterns of sustainable business models. Uh, so uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, second Tuesday of next month or if you're Morris as I've been learning via Skype chat it's the second Wednesday but only sometimes because <laughs> it depends on when the second the first Tuesday is in the other time zone that's uh, right very the, complicated the thing yeah. the things one learns about the, the, the way the world is anyway uh, thank you all very much and uh, see you all uh, in a month's time thank Take you care. Are we allowed to ask more questions? I was about to say, when you seem like you had one lingering one at the end. Yes, yes, yes.
in the hallway. 